So welcome, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining today's Migration in Harmony Research Coordination Network webinar, the first in 2023. My name is Victoria Herman. I am the principal investigator of the network, and I am so thrilled to be hosting two of our amazing steering committee members today to talk about fire science and science storytelling. The network that is hosting this brings together scientists, storytellers, indigenous knowledge holders, public health practitioners, and local leaders to explore the different ways that the Arctic is moving. And I hope that you will join us in our monthly webinars starting today, but moving on throughout 2023. Today, you will be hearing from Dr. Brian Buma and Michael Snyder, two members of our network. Um, Dr. Buma is a conservation-oriented climate change scientist. He's an author and he's a National Geographic explorer. His work focuses on the dynamic changes in ecosystems from wildfires to landslides to the ordinary migration of species in response to changing climates. Mm -hmm. He utilizes a range of methods that you will hear from today, and he will specifically be focusing on fire science. I will be handing over the floor first okay. to Brian, and then I will bring on Michael Snyder, a science storyteller who I'll introduce in about okay. 20 minutes. Um, unfortunately, Brian will not be able to stay for uh, questions at the end. So if you have a specific um, question for Brian, please put that in the chat as he is speaking so that we make sure he can answer before he has to leave. I will be sharing a full recording of this webinar. So if you have to go a bit early, um, don't worry, you will not miss anything. I will make sure that you get the recording. And finally, if you have any questions or trouble throughout this webinar, please put it in the chat or direct message me and I will be happy to help. All right, I will hand my virtual mic over to you, Brian. Great, thanks. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, I apologize for, for the background noise if there is any, I'm at a unavoidable uh, appointment, health appointment. Um, so sort of sitting in a semi-quiet hallway. So I'll do my best, but uh, do do let me know if um, if you don't hear anything or you need me to repeat something or or whatever. I'll also try not to disturb the, the patients <laughs> by not talking too loud. Okay, um, let's see. I need to um, share my screen. Okay, so um, thanks for coming. I, I appreciate everyone coming here, especially those that yeah are calling it at in at um, more difficult time zones. Uh, it's it's wonderful to be here, and thanks to Victoria for organizing. Um, well, not only this this um, events, but the series of events, and really the whole program overall, which is such an interesting and global um, challenge um, dealing with how. Arctic systems are are changing and moving and shifting and and the whole the whole gamut of uh, of uh, trajectories that we're observing um, with rapid climate change. So as as she mentioned, I want to talk uh, real briefly about fire and um, the future of Arctic boreal forests. So this work uh, is sort of an overview. I don't have a lot of data in here, but I'll mention it. Um, but the key players, you always have a billion. Um, uh, support folks that do a ton of work. Um, the key players in this stuff are Phil Higuera, Kate Hayes, Shelby Weiss, and Mich Melissa Lukash, but many others, especially the Bonanza Creek LTER, which is in Fairbanks, um, have also contributed to our understanding here, as well as excellent, excellent research teams I work with um, in Sweden and Norway uh, as well. So uh, I'll move on, maybe. All right, there we go. Um, so, sorry delay on my computer. Uh, so boreal forests, that's that's what I want to get at today. Boreal forests are, as you know, for anyone uh, familiar with the Arctic, 
an immense biome there is depending on how you lump uh, ecosystem types together the boreal forest is the largest terrestrial biome on the planet uh, it rings the globe it covers uh, several different countries some of them more or less completely and a large chunk of it is uh, managed uh, which is, is probably a surprise to many people um, living in the boreal forest, but it turns out large chunks of this uh, thing are actually under, um, under some modicum of human control, but many other areas are not. And uh, due to their high latitude, they are uh, especially vulnerable to climate change, or maybe vulnerable is not the right word, but especially subject to climate change. Because uh, as the polar amplification of climate change means, these regions are warming actually quite a bit faster uh, than most places around the world. And it turns out that the boreal biome is actually also one of the most flammable on the planet. Uh, it doesn't get the press that um, you know fires in California or Spain or Australia typically get, but this is perhaps the most fiery um, forest on the on the planet as well. Um, the average area burned across uh, or in the circumpolar region uh, exceeds uh, two and a half percent annually. And uh, I'll show you data just for Alaska in a little bit. Uh, but as you can see, there's really very little uh, little bits of the boreal forest that haven't burned uh, in the past about 18 years. These are fires, or, or excuse me, 28 years. These are fires going back to about 1984. Now, these fires are widespread, uh, they're extensive, they're typically very severe, meaning they kill everything, and they're increasing. Uh, average annual area burn is expected to increase up to 300% in the next 80 years, or less than that now, by 2100, 80, 78 years. Um, and this is primarily due to three climatic causes. One, it's getting warmer. Um, two, it's uh, that warming is drying uh, vegetation a bit more. And three, the burning season is getting longer. The snow-free period is getting longer. And so these systems, which are, uh, which are highly flammable in the summer, are catching on fire more often. Now, this wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. And from the context of migration, this isn't a bad thing, at least in historical context. And, and what I mean by that is this isn't, in his, historically, this would not have caused any dramatic change in the boreal forest. The boreal forest is actually highly, highly adapted to fire. These that you're seeing in these pictures are black spruce trees. They actually require fire um, to reproduce uh, with, any, uh, with any magnitude, with any strength. They have cones stored in the canopy. If you zoom in, you can actually see little tufts of, of cones on the tops of the taller trees that are catching on fire, that's where the cones are stored. And when those cones uh, burn, when the whole landscape burns, the cones heat up. They're typically not completely consumed. These fires move pretty fast. Seeds pop out of there, reseed, and you get the next crop of, uh, of black spruce trees. And this has been happening for an awful long time. Now, I mentioned these, these fires are pretty dramatic though, if you're on the ground. So I took this video two summers ago. This is in a fire just north of Fairbanks. Um, I'm actually holding my camera or my phone down inside where the soil used to be. So these fires uh, burn down into the ground. So you can see some, some litter here. Um, they kill everything above ground. This fire uh, was actually still burning in the background. You can see a little bit of smoke. Um, but it did kill everything above ground, as you can see. But we would expect that that forest to be fine. Uh, this is an area, this forest was about uh, 120 years old when it oh. burned. So there was plenty of seed sources available, lots of mature trees. We can't see them right here. These seeds are probably still in the canopy of the dead trees that are around, but they'll pop out and fall onto this seed bed um, within a year or so, and they'll sprout up just fine. And you'll end up with a forest like it looks in the background, which in this case is sort of a mixed black spruce um, and deciduous forest, but mostly black spruce. Okay, and like I said, this has been happening a long time. This is a very intensive data slide, and I. I put this slide up with trepidation because I know it's bad practice to put up big, big data slides. I just like how they look. And so just real briefly, what this is showing you is actually the history of what this forest looked like over the past 14,000 years uh, based on pollen. So this is the boreal forest. Um, this is a conglomeration of a bunch of sites in central Alaska. And 
on the left, um, let's see if you, yeah, again, I can use my little highlighter. Um, time is down here, I should say, starting about 14,000 years ago, present is on the right. And up here, and you can ignore these things down here, up here are different types of um, plants. Um, so Picea is the black spruce, that's the spruce family. Then we have birch and alder and willows and aspen and um, various um, shrubs and grasses and sphagnum moss. And basically the bigger the bump here, the uh, more there was on the landscape. So if you see, a, if you see a, a high number, that just means they sort of dominated the landscape. And what we see is that early, um, this would be not long actually post ice age, the landscape was dominated by sort of birch trees and deciduous trees. But really for the past 5,000 years, the landscape has had a pretty steady component of, in this case, spruce. But as you go around the boreal forest, you'll see spruce, you'll see pine and you'll see larch. You'll see a lot of um, needle leaf trees. Uh, and this proportion has stayed fairly, uh, fairly stable, despite quite a few fires. So if you go down to the bottom, you see bumps. And these, these bumps, as you can see from my laser pointer, are fire events. And so basically the spikier it is, the more fires um, there were. And so this has been a very flammable landscape, really for its whole history, but especially for the past 5,000 years. And despite that, it's been a resilient one. We haven't seen a migration of the plant community. And by that, I mean, we haven't seen a lot of movement around as things sort of track a changing climate or track different fire regimes. We've seen a fairly stable uh, setup. Now, <clears throat> again, that doesn't mean it doesn't burn a lot. So I'm going to zoom in for the rest of this, uh, well, until the end, on central Alaska, which is one of the more well-studied um, regions um, in terms of its history, as well as in, in terms of its trajectory going forward. And the interior of Alaska catches on fire a lot. This is your prototypical boreal forest. It would look familiar to anyone who spent time in the boreal, regardless of, of where around the world, I think. Um, this area is sandwiched in between um, the Alaska Range, which is a fairly large mountain range to the south, and the Brooks Range, which is a fairly large mountain range um, to the north. Um, and it occupies essentially this northwest corner of the North American continent. Uh, what you're seeing in the background here are different ecoregion types. They're just sort of different types to orient yourself, like bottomlands versus uplands, sort of river bottoms versus hilly terrain. But it's all forested. It's all um, it's all coniferous forest. And these little splotches are fires. And I think it's it's pretty impressive that you know the, almost the whole landscape um, has been covered by fire since 1940. So these are uh, fires over about a 75, 80 year time period. Um, the perimeters have been drawn with uh, by hand for the most part, um, because obviously we didn't have satellites back in 1940. But as you can see, the, this is a fiery bio, and and this is a this is a time period where climate change wasn't really impacting the fire regime too much, at least in the past, uh, in the 1940 to 1970 time period. We don't think there's too much forcing there, um, and so there's 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 a lot of fire, and if you start actually mapping out how often you get fires that um, uh, have have reburned areas, you get a smaller subset, but still not insignificant. And so I need to explain why that's important. So earlier, I mentioned that uh, these things, these these trees, this, this ecosystem exists in a climate and fire space that's very resilient, uh, meaning those trees grow up, they produce seeds, they burn, they need fire, they need to burn, and then they regenerate and all is well. And that is not a problem. And I mentioned about a hundred year, 150 year time between fires for that to, to function to open. Well, it turns out if, if you increase the frequency of fire to say every 20 years or every 30 years, you have a real problem because all of a sudden those seeds are gone. They haven't recovered yet. And so you're burning essentially the baby trees and there's no seed to recover. So after, after a couple fires in a row, all of a sudden you've lost any ability to regenerate. And because they're so specialized for fire, they can't, they can't adapt. They can't, um, uh, th their seeds are not well adapted to blow in from the edges. These are the black spruce trees and the, and the pine trees you find in Canada and elsewhere. Um, they don't, they're, they're not very well at wind dispersed. They're not animal dispersed. And so you have a real, a real problem if you start getting short interval fires. And that's where the, the change that we're seeing today comes in. So, 
when you get those two fires in, in, or three or more in, in, in short succession, we see a shift and we could call this essentially a migration. And I will sort of use those terms later when I talk a little bit more about climate space, um, because we have not only a movement of climate, but we have a movement of a fire regime and that that migration of the biome. It isn't accomplished by the trees getting up and moving, of course, like you'd see with animal species, but it's accomplished over multiple generations of a failure to regenerate after a fire and then um, movement elsewhere. But let's make this a bit more concrete by just seeing what it looks like. These are three pictures of uh, the same fire. So this is a fire, uh, well, actually not the same fire, the top two are the same fire, but the same the same time period. So in the top two, there was a fire that burned in 2005 and the bottom is a fire that burned in 2004. They were very close together. These pictures are actually only taken about um, half a kilometer apart from each other. Um, the difference though, is that um, the the spots differ in how many fires that happened in in the recent past so the top one was that typical situation where you have one fire it last burned about 150 years ago and you see a lot of green and this this picture was taken in about 28 these pictures were taken in 2019 uh, you see a ton of green and in there there's a lot of regenerating trees and you can see the the tall standing dead ones these black black lines up there well those are that, that, that was the source of the seed for this regeneration. And this is a perfectly happy forest. This is exactly what we would have seen over that 5,000 years of paleo history I showed you earlier. This middle setting though, burned in 1967 and then burned again. So it had about a 35 year <laughs> period between fires. And lo and behold, you don't see those tall dead standing trees like you do up here because they all fell over. They burned in 1967 and fell over since. And so there was only a couple. There's You can see a baby spruce tree here that was burned in that fire in 2005, and there's a couple more sort of leaning over here. We don't see much regeneration in this plot, not in terms of the forest that was before. What we see instead are birch. We see aspen. We see willow. We see broadleaf species, which are a very, very different type of ecosystem. They have, uh, well, I'll get, I'll get to change why they differ later, but they're a very different type of ecosystem in terms of carbon and wildlife habitat and things like that. And on the bottom, we actually have a forest that burned three times in that time period, 1957, 1974, and then 2004. And now we see an even fur further change. We see almost a, almost a step-like landscape. There's much more grass in this case. There's much more ground moss. Um, thin thin moss we just see bunches of willow and and fairly few tree species this is an ecosystem shift that's reflecting climate or it's reflecting what these species can tolerate in terms of climate but it's triggered by an increase uh, in fire activity in the boreal forest and this seems to be a real trend so this is my second and of two i think data slides um, what we're seeing is uh, an increase in fires that occur over a period of less than 20 years. And so um, I'll explain these graphs real quick. They're showing the same thing, but for different time periods. So on the bottom, you have, um, you have a, a time uh, going, starting from different points in time. This one starts in 1993. This one starts in 2003. So that's time up to the, the last, uh, when this was published, the last data we had was 2016. There's a, there's a big lag on fire data sometimes. So, you know, we're often operating four or five years in the past. Uh, the, the, uh, the black line and black dots are the actual occurrence of these short interval, short interval fires, the ones that trigger those changes you just saw the pictures for, the loss of forests. Uh, the red lines are what in the sciences we call a null model. They're basically a, uh, a check on ourselves. This is what would happen in the absence of any sort of um, interaction, just by random chance. And what we see is that there isn't a lot of increase in those short interval fires for less than 10 years. This was, a, this was basically us saying, um, does, this, does it make sense? Like if you burn something, is it likely to burn again in 10 years? And the answer is, is no, we, we're not seeing an increase in short interval fires less than 10 years. This black line isn't going up very much. Um, it, just based on climate, we'd expect it would. So actually there's there's kind of a negative feedback here. Over the course of about 10 years, if you, catch, if you, if you burn a landscape, it's unlikely to catch on fire again, even if the climate's kind of pushing it in that direction. That's again, that's this red line. And that's probably just because there isn't a lot of fuel left. There's no shrubs, there's it's just burnt, right? This, this is pretty intuitive. 
But what was surprising is that if you go to a 20 year increment, you do see an increase. And in fact, that increase is, in, is increasing, that rate of increase is about the same as climate. And so what we can infer from that is that after, you know, after 10 years, so 10 to 20 years or so, uh, those landscapes are just as flammable as they were before. Mm -hmm. And so as climate gets warmer and warmer and warmer, that negative feedback, which was limiting fire on the left-hand side here, so that you don't see this increase, even though it's getting hotter and, and, and more, more fire weather, more conducive to fire, um, we, we don't see that feedback happening over 20 years. And this is a concern because this is still, still quite short. That's still much shorter than the species are adapted to. So the inevitable conclusion from this is that we'd expect to see more and more loss of coniferous forests in the boreal, uh, serotonous coniferous forests specifically, but that's essentially the entirety of North America uh, and, and parts of uh, Eurasia. Uh, we'd expect to see ongoing loss as you get these fires which, which burn on top of old fire footprints. Um, and just to wrap up with the paleo, um, we see this in the past too. Now these these short interval fires, the frequency of them is becoming uh, quite impressive and novel, and it, it's unprecedented. About five percent of the fires in the past, uh, depending on what part of the part of the um, boreal forest you're in, about five percent of the um, fires in the past thirty years have been these short interval fires, which is. 5%, if that sounds small, trust me, it's not. Because if you go look back in the paleo history, they were extremely rare. But you can find them because, you know, you can find anything if you look over a long enough time period. Uh, there's, there's, in fact, there was three of them that occurred on a time period of less than about 20, 25 years. And what we see is, remember that pollen metric I said, you could do sort of look at pollen and how it changes over time. It changes a lot when you get those short interval fires. So we, so this suggests that not only are we seeing this now, this did happen in the past and it had a big effect, impact in the past too. So this is a nice, from a scientific point of view, this is a, this is a nice check. This is basically us able to say, you know, this isn't just, this isn't just where we picked our spot in Alaska or where we picked our field site here or there, or just, you know, luck of the site. This happens now and it's happening a lot. This happened in the past too, just not as much. And so we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a change that we recognize. We're seeing a mechanism that we understand. We're just seeing it ramp up. Um, and as those fires continue to increase, we expect it to ramp up further and further and further. So this is a, a strangely blurry map of um, the expected increase in fire frequency um, in, by the end of the century. And so any place that's red is expected to see a lot more fire. Any place that's blue probably will actually see a little bit less due to shifts in precipitation. And then the yellow is kind of in the middle. And if you if you look at the boreal, boreal forest, we see in general an expectation of major increases, especially in northwestern Canada, uh, Alaska, maybe a little less in the in the central boreal of Canada, but then again, quite a bit more, in, especially in eastern uh, eastern Siberia, northern China, uh, Mongolia, those sorts of boreal regions over there. So those are places where we'd expect to see um, potential loss of forests. And what does that mean in the context of migration? You can think of vegetation migration as essentially the tracking of uh, a vegetation community along with its climate space. And climate, uh, this is usually accomplished through disturbances in the case of forests, because forests are tough. Trees are, once they get established, trees are pretty tough. They can tolerate a lot of bad climatic conditions, especially in the boreal where temperature swings and precipitation swings are so huge from year to year. They're, they're pretty tough. And so that doesn't, that, but their younger stages, their early juvenile stages are less tough. And so we usually see migrations of forests being sporadic. Um, so triggered by disturbances like chunky, you know, that like uh, it, 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 nothing happens for a while and then there's a big disturbance and new species come in or new ecosystem types come in. And then that sort of proceeds in a sporadic sort of um, discrete fashion rather than a nice continuous movement. So what are we expecting to see up there? Well, it turns out that you can actually uh, map out ecosystems pretty well based 
more or less, especially in the north, uh, um, or a high latitudes, based on their summer temperatures and their precipitation. And the boreal forests occupy a somewhat intermediate zone of relatively high precipitation for the region and relatively moderate mean July temperature. You generally don't find trees lower than about 10 degrees at all, lower than about 10 degrees um, C in the summer. And there's generally a minimum threshold of about 400 or so uh, millimeters of precipitation every year. The climate in these areas is shifting in the direction of this pink arrow. It's actually moving from a boreal forest space to a more steppe-like space where it's warmer. Precipitation either hasn't changed or gone down a little bit. Um, and we, we expect to see then, you know, a steppe-like vegetation composition, the shift of boreal forest potentially north, but the invasion of steppe-like systems from the from the south or from drier regions and that's kind of what we're seeing uh, at least in the at least in the short term obviously we can't project the future for this landscape too um, empirically but did we expect these things to continue this shift from a typical boreal forest it's a normal fire regime to an area that does look more step like more open uh, open woodlands not a lot of trees much more grass this discrete migration of this ecosystem type is going to have a lot of knock-on effects, right? You can imagine the massive differences between uh, uh, wildlife that calls these that call these two habitats home. Uh, the we'd expect to see um, probably more hare, uh, more browsers potentially in this system. Uh, it's unknown what the carnivores will do. Um, and those those changes feedback also, right? Like so, in these systems, we actually see a big influence of snowshoe hare on the vegetation itself. So it's fascinating because it's such a complex story of discrete sort of chunky movement of the forests and then more continuous movement of the animals. But then the animals are influencing the ways in which the forests regenerate and develop. Um, and and so there's this this backwards feedback where you have the, the plants influencing the animals, which can influence the plants. All that's in the context of changing things, other important resources like changing carbon. These areas, these forests, um, and I've measured it in these in this plot, uh, are underlaid by perm permafrost. Uh, permafrost being um, ground that's frozen for two or more years, a lot of carbon in it typically. Um, it's basically a, a long-term carbon storehouse. Uh, because it's just frozen. It's like having meat in your freezer or something. Uh, as uh, the, the fires don't really hurt the permafrost at all. There's typically a little bit of thawing, not associated with the flames, but just associated with more light hitting the ground, like in this stage, but it recovers quite quickly. But if you go to these sorts of situations where the forest has been essentially permanently removed, or at least the thick conifer forests have essentially been what, what appears to be permanently removed, that permafrost is gone. And it turns out you can't find permafrost in, in this site at all. And this one, it's quite deep. And so we'd expect this to be a potential positive feedback to the climate cycle as well, because you've lost all this carbon. It's like you took the meat out of your freezer and it started to decompose on your countertop. It's all gone into the atmosphere. Okay, so research directions going forward, like what can we do about it? Well, there's this is a difficult one. Um, this is an interesting, interesting challenge, but we don't have enough research or knowledge really there in this space to really know how this is going to go. Uh, we we know the the ways in which vegetation typically follows climate, so we kind of know the inevitable. Like I mentioned earlier, a gradual loss of a lot of conifer forests anyway, um, shift to deciduous or even uh, or broad excuse me broadleaf or uh, or even more step like ecosystems. Uh, we assume there'll be a concurrent change in wildlife and a loss of carbon from permafrost stores. Oh, what can we do about it? The people have proposed firefighting. Uh, it may be possible to try and strategically protect patches of forest, maybe those with more permafrost or more wildlife habitat um, via uh, early action. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of history with fire suppression in, in the developed world anyway, or in sort of the more industrialized countries over the 50s and 60s, and with really mixed results uh, and a lot of long-term legacies that have not necessarily been good. So this is a contentious sort of um, research agenda, but it is one that's being pursued, is the ability to manage um, fires in these forests. Another um, research agenda is what I mentioned, is the, the concurrent uh, migration of animals. 
we're essentially creating novel forest landscapes. What are the, how is that going to influence the migration of other species? North? We just don't know. Um, again, I, we can speculate, right? Like based on current, um, like I did, based on current um, relationships between animals and plants, but how that will actually play out you know, that's going to take a, a lot of work and observation. And then, and then of course, human communities in those areas. Um, many of these areas are, live very close to the land and have very close ties uh, and relationships with these ecosystem services and, and, uh, and plant animal communities. How they're going to be able to respond is, uh, is another question as well. So with that, I will wrap it up. Um, and I'm always uh, interested in hearing your, your, um, thoughts and ideas on this topic. Um, as, as Victoria mentioned, I unfortunately have to run um, before the end of this, but don't hesitate to um, send me an email or shoot me a note. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Thank you so, so much, Brian. Uh, if everyone could join in giving a huge virtual applause for a spectacular presentation that I know I took a lot of notes on and will be emailing Brian for some follow-up questions I have. Um, Brian, if you have time for one question before you have to run, we do have yep. one question from Sarah who Hello, Sarah. Thank you for joining in uh, and asking Dr. Buma um, about when you mentioned that fires go into the ground. Uh, Sarah was wondering about the depth of the fire. So is it topsoil only? And if the fire depth um, may be increasing, what are the effects? So thawing of permafrost in the context of a shifting fire regime? Yeah, sure. So that's a great question. So um, these areas, especially the the coniferous forests, the needle leaf forests, um, needles are very resistant to decomposition uh, compared to like broadleaf species. So like an aspen leaf or a birch leaf decomposes over the course of a year or two. Even in the boreal, it decomposes quite quick despite it being cold. Needles last a long time. Uh, and so in these intact boreal forests, like the, the ones that are say hundred years old, like I was saying, the ones we expect to be quite um, resistant um, or, or excuse me, resilient. And the ones in which we would typically see a fire, uh, you usually actually have a pile of needles and you actually have a lot of moss on top of it, up to 30, 40 centimeters of organic matter. Uh, it's a mat. It feels like you're walking on a pillow. And underneath that is where you'll find the soil, the actual, the actual dirt. Um, now, in these severe fires, the dirt usually doesn't really burn much. Dirt's not terribly flammable. You can lose it. But that organic layer can go away completely. And in fact, in the boreal, in, in the fire sciences, that's really how you judge fire severity. You don't go by how many trees were killed, because generally every tree was killed. You go by how much of the organic soil was consumed and how completely in space. So if you have a plot where you know all of that organic mat is gone and you just have organ uh, just have uh, dirt left, we call it mineral soil mineral, um, that would be a really severe fire. And that actually be fairly unusual. Usually it's more like the pictures uh, the video I showed you where you see lumps and, and things like that. If you have that complete loss of an organic layer, then that also favors those broadleaf species like birch and aspen. So we can actually see an increase and in a loss of conifer trees and an increase in these uh, broadleaf trees uh, just by an increase in severity. Uh, I was talking mostly about frequency, like short intervals, but you can get it with an increase in severity too, because um, when you lose that entire layer, you favor these, these sort of other types of communities. Now, as to the question about permafrost, permafrost, um, there, there's and when you get into mineral soil, let's let's imagine this is the this is uh, this is the organic layer, and that will go underneath it. Uh, so underneath it, we have that mineral soil, the dirt, right? Um, a lot of that freezes every winter, some sometimes all the way to the top. Um, but every summer, some of it will thaw out, and so that first little bit is called the active layer, and that's active because it freezes every winter, it thaws every summer. Uh, and so you can have plant roots in there. The plants can survive in that because they, they do freeze, but they can they 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 wake up in the summer. There's liquid water, et cetera, et cetera. Below that, 
is the permafrost that sticks around. And so when you get these, these fires, it's not the heat of the fire that thaws the permafrost. The permafrost doesn't thaw right away. So if you like if you go into that place where I took the video, again, that fire was still burning, just you know, a couple of kilometers away. The permafrost was still there. Like I, I in fact that was in in the June. So it was actually really close to the surface. The, or excuse me, the active layer was still frozen really close to the surface. Um, over the course of it, if in, in historical times, over the course of 20 years, say, that active layer would have gotten bigger as the permafrost thawed. But then it would have recovered as those conor, as the regenerating conifer leaves needles fell to the ground, started insulating the ground. They function as a good insulator. The moss came back and it, it would essentially refreeze. So you'd have a temporary dip in, in, in permafrost volume. You'd have an increase or an increase in active layer depth um, slowly increasing over let's say 10 or 15 years you know as it slowly thaws because it's exposed to the sun in the summer the soil surfaces but then recovering right as the as the as that insulation builds back in but in a deciduous forest uh, where you uh, or excuse me a broadleaf forest where you have those more easily decomposable leaves you don't get that buildup of that 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 insulating pillow over this over the actual mineral soil over the dirt and so instead of you see that initial dip but you don't see that recovery because the every summer it thaws a little bit more and a little bit more because it's exposed to the warmer summer temperatures it'll still refreeze every winter generally speaking although sort of counterintuitively more snow can actually slow that process down because snow can insulate the ground from very cold temperatures uh, and sometimes you do get more snow if you have a deciduous species because you can get more snow under the ground but regardless you see that that decrease that you, that the same one you'd see in a, in a normal sort of fire in a coniferous forest you get that decrease but you don't see the recovery and so it just sort of tails off and then like those pictures by the time you've had three or four fire or two or three fires in you know 50 60 years there may be permafrost still down there, but it's at least a meter and a half down because we couldn't find it. And that's about how far we could probe on that particular survey. Thank you, Sarah, for asking that great question. And thank you, Brian, for that great answer. And um, again, please join me in a final round of applause. Thank you so, so much for sharing the last hour with us um, and your expertise and amazing experience. Um, we so appreciate it. And I will be sharing after this live uh, webinar, a recording for those of you who may have missed the first part of Brian's talk and his contact information. If you have follow-up questions about the future of uh, Arctic fires and fire research. But thank you so, so much, Brian. Um, and I will move thank us you. on to our next speaker. Um, but thank you, Brian. So it is now my um, amazing honor to bring up our next speaker, shifting from Arctic fire science to Arctic science storytelling. Um, Michael Snyder is a documentary filmmaker. He's a photographer and he is a scientist who is focused on impact oriented storytelling from documenting families in the high north to exploring changing light conditions in the Arctic Ocean. Um, Mike is interested in creating media that matters in the face of climate and environmental crises. If you have not seen his latest documentary, into the dark. It is awe-inspiring, um, and it looks at how light is making its way into the darkest regions of the Arctic. Today, we have the absolute honor of hosting Mike um, so he could share some of his recent experiences in documentary photography and his expertise in teaching others how to practice the skills needed to use storytelling for social impact. So I will hand over my virtual mic to Michael. 
And as a reminder, uh, we are recording this. So if you need to leave a little early, you will not miss any of his presentation. But we hope that you will use the chat as Mike is presenting to ask questions when we open it up for a moderated discussion after his presentation. With that, the floor is yours, Mike. Great. Thanks, Victoria. Glad to be here. Get the screen share going. Great. So um, it's wonderful to be here today. Thanks so much for coming along. It's great to have a have a great turnout. Uh, as Victoria said, my name is Mike Snyder. I'm a photographer uh, and a filmmaker. Um, I'm based in, in Charlottesville, Virginia, just a bit south of Washington, D.C. And, and most of my work is focused around uh, climate change, environmental justice, and social justice work. And in, in addition, uh, as Victoria also mentioned, I'm, I'm what's called an, an impact producer meaning that I'm, I'm really interested in how we take the work that we make, we take, take the stories that we have, we take the science that we have, and we drive social change around them. So how do we do that is a big question. How do we go about making these stories that, that, that make a difference? And so that's what I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be talking to you um, about today. I, I will say in advance, maybe somewhat disappointingly from a, a talk uh, from somebody that works in uh, photography, we don't have a lot of photos that we're going to be looking at today. I think I've put a few in this talk. Um, but if you do want to check out any of my work or connect with me, um, you can take a look at, at my sites, which are down here at the bottom. Um, there's an Instagram site and, and a website. Uh, and do feel free to reach out to me as well. You can get me at michaelosnyder at gmail.com. Um, and I'll happily share these slides with you as well um, if you want to be able to use them uh, for your own uses later. Okay, so 10 elements of stories that drive social change is what we're going to look at today. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and spill the punchline to start here. Um, this is a, a, a slide that's going to guide what we're going to talk about. Feel free to screen, to screen capture it. Uh, and, and I will say to start here that each one of these we could spend a semester unpacking, right? Each one of these are, are very big topics. So we're, we're really, really going to do a flyby here and look at how what these things mean and how you can potentially use them. So in, in brief, here we go. You wanna have an interesting topic that's got a novel hook. You wanna be able to shift that topic to becoming a compelling story. And we're gonna look at what a story is and it's kind of bare bones sense. You wanna tell a story that activates both sides of the brain, right? So you wanna unlock the emotional side in your audience, but you also wanna have enough information and different kinds of information that it compels them to action. Of course, you wanna have great imagery. That's at the very, very core of visual storytelling. You want to build ecosystems of media, and we're going to explain what I mean by that. You want to do your work with an empowerment focus. That's an ethical question we're going to look at. Uh, and finally, you want to have an impact strategy that's built around meaningful partnerships, and you want to be able to publish your work, and you want to be able to publish it effectively. So these are the things we're going to look at today. All right, so starting with topic, really busy slide, and that's on purpose here, because the, the, the point is, is you can tell a story about absolutely anything, right? All of these different topics are viable topics for really, really great stories that you can tell and make a difference by telling them, right? The, the core question is, no matter which topic that you end up choosing to tell your story about, is knowing why you've chosen that topic, right? And this is what I want you to think about here, is putting yourself and the story that you choose to tell in the middle of this multiple Venn diagram. I don't know what you call a Venn diagram that's a star, but this multiple aspect Venn diagram, how do we land our stories in the middle of this, uh, this diagram? And so some questions to direct that are, first, what do I care about? What's personally meaningful to me? What do I know about? What do I have personal knowledge of? Maybe that's knowledge is an academic knowledge. Maybe it's a personal knowledge. Both of those things count. What do I have a personal connection and access to? Am I able to go to this place to be able to tell this story? Um, do I have connections there to get the, the meaningful results that I, that I need? Do I have the funds to be able to access this and so on? Right, we talked about novelty. Knowing what's out there is important, right? How do we build off of the previous work? And this is particularly important from a media perspective because so much of it is driven around novelty, catching people's interest, you know, getting them to explore something that's new. That may be taking an old story and finding a, a new hook on it, a new way to tell that story, right? But the idea is knowing what's already out there and adding something new to the conversation. Is the story timely? Is this important? Do people want to know about it and why? And finally, is this really visually compelling? or narratively compelling. And, and I'll, I'll challenge you and say that there's a way to take most stories, let's say a story about rock moss, something that doesn't seem outwardly visually compelling, uh, and to find a way to make that interesting. And of course, part of doing that 
is working with a pro that has experience in, in, in the field. But thinking about these things in advance and trying to put yourself, ask yourself these questions and put yourself in the middle of the circle is the goal. And of course, if you can do that, right, then you can tell a story that will be accurate, it'll be ethically done, it's gonna be effective, hopefully it's going to be interested, interesting to audiences, and you're gonna be sustained in doing the work. So for all the projects that I do on, I try as often as I can to land in the middle of this circle as I pick my topic to work on. Okay, but even, even more critically, right, you've got your topic. And this is always seems to be the core challenge when I'm working with scientists is we know we have our topic we want to work on. We know an awful lot about it, but how do we turn it into a story? And what is a story anyway, right? Well, I just want to say first, why stories? Like, why do we think in the form of stories? Um, and as, as it was mentioned before, I'm a, I'm a climate scientist um, by training, and I made the transition to becoming a visual storyteller. So this, this idea is at the core of, of, of my work and my thinking. And, and the story that I like to tell that, that highlights this story uh, it's about the Cuyahoga River fire. And, and maybe some of you have seen this photo that's here on the left. Um, this is from the 1969 uh, Time Magazine article that showed the Cuyahoga River uh, in Ohio on fire. And of course, it was on fire because it was so incredibly polluted. Um, and there was a public outrage around this. And indeed, a number of acts, including the Clean, Clean Water Act, um, were passed not long afterwards. So this is commonly known. A lot of people know about the story. But what isn't known and what I think is particularly interesting is that the river had actually burned 13 times prior to the 1969 article, right? From 1838 to 1952, there were 13 fires. And it was well known, um, of, of course, uh, on the Cuyahoga River, but also well known in the science community. So what changed in 1969 that made such a big difference, made a huge impact? And the answer is, of course, there was a journalist and a photographer that showed up to be able to capture this image and to tell this story. And the reason why this works is we can take something that is, seems to be so far away and so disconnected to us and suddenly make it personal, right? Visual stories have, a, have the potential to do that because we can imagine our own river and our own backyard on fire and looking like this. We can connect to it in a meaningful, personal way. That's one aspect. The second aspect I wanna talk about here, this is the famous um, Earthrise photo uh, from 1968 on, on, on the right. Um, and this photo is oftentimes pointed at as being one of the photos that really got the environmental movement going in the United States as a, as a popular movement. And, and of course, it did so because it's the best self-portrait we, we've ever had. You know, here we are, we, we see ourselves for what we are, this incredibly precious um, uh, ball floating in, in, in space, but surrounded by, by, by nothingness. Um, so, you know, this this image, what it's able to do, it's able to take an idea, and it's not a new idea, right? This idea that we're, we're, we're going around the sun, we have the moon going around us. This is an ancient idea. This has been known since antiquity, understood since in, in, in antiquity. But what this does, it takes an abstract idea, and it makes it much more concrete and relatable, right? So this is why we think about stories. It has the potential to be able to do these things. Okay, so what's a story? Um, well, that's a big topic. And what I like to, to teach when I when I talk about this is taking this slide, this is taken from, from Pixar, from their storytelling lab. And I think it's the best distillation that I've ever seen of a story. And they use this model essentially, and I, I would encourage you to go and watch a Pixar movie and see if you can um, apply this and see if it works, um, but to design the Pixar movies when they, when, when they create them. And so this is the way it works. Once upon a time, there was a blank, everyday blank, one day blank, because of that blank, because of that blank, until finally blank. So this is the core breakdown. And I'm going to look at this on the next slide and show you what it is that underlies this, the elements that we need to have in place to be able to tell a story. Okay, so once upon a time, there was a uh, and every day blank. This is all about characters, right? And great stories are based around characters. They could be human characters, they could be non-human characters, but they're characters. And we understand characters. We understand what they what they want, what they do, what they're about, what matters to them, the opinions that they have, their strengths, their weaknesses, their flaws. And in doing so, in developing characters, we connect with them. And that sense of connection is really important. Um, and the, and the, the research around this indicates that we tend to connect best with people. And of course, charismatic megafauna next. So even if you're telling a story that's about glaciers or about, again, rock moss, something that doesn't seem connected to people, find people to connect the story with because they're going to be a really important part of making that connection with the audience. But anyway, we have characters and we think about these topics through the experience of the characters. The characters are the window to understand the topic. Okay, and then one day something happens, right? All great stories have conflict in the middle. No conflict, no story. So what's happening? What happens to these characters? What happens to the world? What's changing? And it's that conflict that sets in motion our story. 
In other words, it sets the character in motion to do something to overcome that conflict. So the because of that, because of that is what happens in the middle of your story, right? You've got, they take action, stories about action, agency, what's happening, what's happening, what are they doing, right? Show us doing, tell us about doing. Because of the doing, they have to become vulnerable, they've got to change, they've got to think about things, they've got to adapt, right? Great stories about adaptation and change. And if they do act or don't act, there's stakes. Like, what are the outcomes here? If nothing happens, right? What are the if they don't find the answers to the research they're looking for? On the other hand, if we can find these these answers, what will happen? What's the possibility? What's the upside benefit, right? And finally, because of all of these things, because of going through these things, because of facing the conflict, because of taking these actions, great characters are transformed, right? So stories think about transformation. Okay, so as you think about taking your topic and shifting it to becoming a story, think about these words here in red and what they are and what they mean, and how you can find ways to, to move that in your story. Okay, if you can do those things, right, we get to point number three here, right? If you do those things effectively, you get an emotional response from your audience. And we know that this is the most important thing when it comes to motivating audiences to connecting with your topic and doing something about it, right? Having a deep emotional connection. We love to think of ourselves as rational animals. You just give us the data. We're going to make the best possible decisions about the future. We don't work that way for a variety of reasons, right? Emotion is a really, really important modifier of what we do of our personal choices and behavior, our attitudes and our actions. And the reason why we've got Wally up here is um, that movie has been consistently pointed out as one of the most effective movies to motivate people to care about environmental issues. There's not a single shred of environmental data in there, but there's a really cute little robot um, that really touches us with a message and his personal transformation throughout the movie. And that moves people to care about the issue, right? So you want to, if you do those things as elements of stories, you connect to emotion and that's going to drive people towards change. But it can't be pure, um, purely the emotional side of the brain either, right? If we want to tell a great story and we really want to move people, we do need to do the other side, which is the more native side. If you come from a science background, you come from a journalism background, perhaps in a traditional sense, this is the more native side, is the knowledge base, the information base. But what I'm going to challenge you here on is a, a sort of a slightly different model of different kinds of knowledge, okay? So let's look at this. Typically, when we tell a story, uh, we think about, we start, well, I'm going to start with the upper left and kind of circle around a clockwise motion here. We start with what knowledge, right? And what knowledge describes the problem? It's factual, it's descriptive. And if you think about climate change, it's the way climate change might be taught in high school, right? You're told what it is, why, uh, how it comes to be, what the underlying mechanics of it are in a physical scientific sense, right? And this is kind of a base level knowledge. And you need this to be able to understand the issue and be able to act upon it. Right. And then maybe in a more kind of critical, maybe this is like a, a college level, collegiate level sort of understanding. Maybe this is the better side of journalism. We don't just describe the problem. We get critical about it. We think, well, uh, how do we get here and why and where is it going? What are the blocks to change? Right. This is a more complicated, um, more nuanced kind of writing, kind of storytelling that does this. Right. And again, maybe kind of a college level of education, you should be able to understand that. But here's the here's the critical, critical thing. What we know is if we just have these two kinds of knowledge in our story, again, it's very, very unlikely we're going to move people to change, right? Or, or societies to change at large. It's these bottom two kinds of knowledge that are really the important ones if we want to get our audience to listen, to sit up and pay attention, and to do something about it, whatever that something is, okay? These are the final two ones that are oftentimes missing from stories, and I'm always hammering my students to include them in the stories that they tell. The bottom right one is how knowledge. This is solutions focused. Okay, so we identify the problem. What can we do about it, right? What is being done about it? Is there any, anything we can showcase here? Any, any, any case studies we can look at? What's the practical application of this? How can we get creative and solve this problem? And finally, and left out most of all, is sort of looking forward, you know, not looking down at our feet, here's what we can do, but looking at where can this go? What are the opportunities here? You know, what's the future that we can see if, if we manage this challenge effectively, right? What's the big picture? And this is oftentimes left out altogether. Okay, number five, imagery. Of course, great stories and apologies. I don't know if you can hear that in the background. I'm in the basement of an artist collective and there's a toilet line behind me. Anyway, hopefully you cannot hear the, the flushing sound. Uh, so imagery, great visual stories, of course, have wonderful imagery to accompany them. Um, this is a, a photo. You can decide whether it's wonderful or not. It's one I happen to have. Um, this is a photo that I shot in Svalbard uh, a few years ago for, for a story that I worked on. Um, too big of a topic for today, how to make great images, how to make great films. So what I'm going to point you towards instead, and this is thinking that 
most folks in here are, are not uh, visual storytellers as their, as their core practice, is finding a visual storyteller or a storyteller um, in general to, to partner with, right? And ideally, you find one that understands the issues that you work with in an intimate, intimate way. There's some benefits of doing that. So th this would be my list of organizations that I would suggest to reach out to. Uh, the Blue Earth Alliance, International League of Conservation Photographers, Society of Environmental Journalists, uh, New Day Films, that, those are filmmakers. Um, the other ones are sort of journalists and photographers, uh, specifically for films, New Day Films. Uh, and of course, uh, Nat Geo has got a wonderful cohort of folks as well. And if you don't find what you're looking for in any of those organizations, and you can reach out to them and you can peruse their, um, their site and, and their list of folks that, that work underneath those, um, the, those branches, uh, you can also look at awards and various outlets uh, to see who's winning awards in the field, because it might be somebody that's really great, but is not associated with any of these organizations. And if you're not familiar with the sort of uh, photography or filmmaking awards that are out there, I suggest taking a look at Photo Contest Insider, well, uh, which sort of collates all of these um, these competitions together. And it's it's a tool that a lot of us on my end of work use to, to send work out there. So you can take a look there and see if you can find somebody. And what I would encourage you to do is don't hesitate to reach out, right? As journalists, as photographers, filmmakers, visual storytellers, we need great stories. Like we really want to hear from you. And that personal, uh, personal connection makes a really big difference, right? You may or may not get a response, but it doesn't make a difference. Reach out and find somebody. And if you do, it could be the right person. Okay, let's talk a little bit about ecosystems of media. And I'm going to give you um, an example here as I talk about this. Uh, so the, 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 the picture in the middle is from another story that I worked on. This is the one that Victoria referenced that I also made a film about. Um, this is a still image um, th that I shot uh, about the polar night and research that was being done there about light pollution. And what I want to impress upon you here is that once you've done the hard work, and the hard work is picking your topic, finding a great story, getting the funding to tell it, making the time to tell it, making sure it's a good story, right? That's the really hard work, actually. Once you've done that, it behooves you to not just tell one kind of story, but to potentially tell many kinds of stories and to use all the different media we have at our disposal to be able to do that. And the reason why that's important is that when we reach out to these different kinds of, of storytelling tools, we have the opportunity to reach diverse audiences. And that's really, really important because as I'm sure many folks here know, we are way too much in the choir on so many of these issues, right? And all of these different outlets, these different ways to tell stories allow us to tweak the story just a little bit in a way that'll reach an a different audience with a slightly different message. So for practically all of the stories that I do, I try to activate as many of these as I possibly can. Now, for me, I'm a multimedia storyteller. I'm pretty native in most of these spaces, but this can be a lot to handle too. So if you want to do this kind of storytelling, it necessarily, almost necessarily, it means building partnerships with um, uh, di different storytellers of different disciplines, right? You might have somebody that's a writer. You might have somebody that's a videographer. You might have somebody um, that does audio stories and podcasting and so on. Okay, so this is a really, really powerful tool to get out of the box. And of course, all of these different stories build buzz back to each other, right? They're self-referential on, online, right? So it's a way to have a big presence um, at not an enormous extended cost to be able to do that. So really, really important opportunity here that wasn't available to us 10 years ago, right? N now, these sort of tools are available. They're actually available in our phone, or there's lots of other tools that, that we can do it with. So it's a really cool opportunity. Okay. Text heavy slide, um, but I wanted it to be text heavy um, because you can take a look at this later and sit with some of the writing here. Um, but I'm gonna just kind of walk you through this now. Um, and the, the idea here about an empowerment focus to the stories we tell as opposed to an extraction focus is really an ethical question. And the idea is that it's not just the stories that we tell, are they great stories? It's how we tell them that's also important, right? What our methods are as a storyteller. And unfortunately, in journalism, there's a long-term problem of our stories being very, very extractive. And I'll just go through very quickly what it means to tell a story extractively. That's the left-hand column over here, okay? So it means we helicopter into the issue, right? We don't, it's not relationship-based, right? We show up, we get what we need, we get out from the area and from the community that we're working within. In other words, we're just extracting it with very little benefits coming back. The voice that we're using, we're telling our stories is just our voice, the outsider, um, uh, expert in, in, in quotes, and not the voice of the impacted individual or communities that we're working with. Okay, again, there's very little benefits that are coming back to those communities. And the audience is a re, is an audience that's remote to that area. It's a global audience. It's, it's essentially entertainment for somebody with a lot of money somewhere else. 
Okay. And I don't mean to say that they're, they're, the good things can't happen under this mode of media, but there's an opportunity if we can shift uh, the way that we think about making stories that can unlock a lot more benefits and do, do it in a way that I think is much more ethically sound. So what does empowerment focused media look like? Well, it starts with relationship, right? It's all about relationship. And the relationship is the work, it is the goal, it is the outcome, right? You're there to build relationships with place and with the people that you're working with. And you maintain them before and after the story is made. Uh, the voices that are being heard in the story are certainly you as the scientist or the writer or the photographer, the filmmaker, whoever, whoever it is, but you're echoing the voices that you hear on the ground and you're elevating up and including those and you're checking in to make sure that those narratives and those voices and that expertise, that knowledge is woven into your story, right? The benefits are hopefully that you can find a way to bring some benefits back to the community that you're working with. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this. I just included a few in here. Um, you can license images to communities or local nonprofits that work on those issues to help kind of push their advocacy forward. Um, you can help to use your work to find grants to pursue uh, community-based efforts. Um, and you can indeed uh, train community um, folks to be able to tell their own stories as well. So there's a lot of different ways you can get creative about thinking about how do I involve my community of focus, my area of focus, and empower them to tell their own stories. And finally, and this is important too, for all the stories that I tell, I certainly want to get a global audience. You know, I'll go for a, a marquee, um, you know, worldwide uh, um, outlet whenever I publish, but I'll usually do a regional outlet and I'll do a local outlet as well. I think it's really important that the folks in these communities that we work in, they end up seeing their own stories, feeling connected to their own stories in their own localities. And so I oftentimes push to say, I'm, I wanna do this on all, on all levels. And I make sure that all levels understand that as I work with them on the publishing side. Okay, so an empowerment focus. Number eight, you have an impact strategy. And, and what that means is that from the beginning of the project, when you first think about it, you first think you, what, you, you want to tell this story, you design your story, you start thinking about what's going to happen on the back end, right? That's design from inception, right? You think about how that impact is going to work. What is it you want to do? So here's another um, slide that you can screen capture. You can make one of these on, on your own. Um, this is a, a sample sheet to make an impact strategy. I do these for all the projects that I work on. I'm just going to tell you what these various columns are to give you a sense for how you think about this. Um, first, you want to think about what are the core messages you want to get across. And what the research tells us is that typically when someone walk, they read an article or they walk out of a film, there's one to three things they can remember. Okay, so if you had to, you know, uh, dumb it down to the three things you want to say, the one thing you want to say and put them in order, they would go in this column over here. What is it at the core you want to communicate? It doesn't mean you need to dumb it down as an oversimplify the language, but you just need to be very specific about what you want to say. Okay, number two going across is the impact. Well, what are the solutions you really hope to come out of this? What are you pointing towards? What would you, what if anything, would you like to have happen after the publication of your work? Right, and that could be could be a science ask, there could be a social ask, there could be a policy ask, there could be a tech ask, whatever it is. But think carefully about what it is, right? And then along from that, right, in the next column, who can do that? Because one of the things that I know is that I oftentimes can't do that work. And we're going to get into this when we talk about partnerships. Is that me alone? I can't do that. I can't turn those keys, but other folks can, right? So I think up front. Well, who who holds the door to those rooms, right? How do I reach out with them? How do I get in contact with them? Okay, do we think about the kind of impact we have? Are we trying to change minds? Are we trying to change behaviors? Are we building communities? Are we changing structures? Thinking a little bit about the exact mechanisms we want to get after. And then finally, what are our next steps? What are we going to do um, to be able to do this? Um, and if we had more time, we would take some examples here of various films um, that have used uh, th this model and how they have filled these in. Um, but see if you can fill this in for a project that you're working on. Okay, and finally, number 10 and uh, number nine and number 10 together. Um, is building partnerships and having a publication strategy. And the reason I put these together is, they, is that they really go hand in hand. Um, so this is again a, a busy slide. Uh, let me explain what this is. This is my partnership and publication strategy um, filled in after the end of the project for Into the Dark. Again, that's that um, film and National Geographic uh, article that I published a number of years ago about research in the polar night that's looking at light pollution. Okay, so you've got funders, distributors, industry partners, nonprofit education advocacy partners, and then art and gallery 
partners. And I didn't have these all filled in at once, right? They filled in over time as, as various partners came on board. I think I've got one more slide where I'm gonna show you the sort of order that they came in or, or kind of talk you through it. But before I began, I strategized some of these. I, before I ever reached out, I knew some of these were ones I, was, I wanted to reach out to. I had a goal to reach out to and other ones filled in over time. And actually, rather than go on to the next slide, um, I, I'll just stick with this one and kind of walk you through how these partners jumped on board. And again, the reason why partners are so important is that they, when you bring them on, you gain all of their networks. And impact is all about networking, right? And again, you can't do that from where you sit, but maybe they can do it. And they all can reach slightly different networks. They all can also bring different resources to bear, right? And so when you add people on, you add organizations on, you do it in a meaningful way, you're just turning that multiplication factor up and up and up and up and up in terms of your ability to drive impact. So probably if there's anything other than the story slide of the most important thing you can do, effective partnerships are probably uh, number one, if not maybe number two here for the most important of the 10. Okay, so how did I do this particular project into the dark? Well, it started with a grant um, that um, I worked with the University of Tromso, that's up in the, in the Northwest corner. That's where the researchers that I was working with um, were based out of. And we got a grant uh, through the EU to do that research and a line item in that was for visual storytelling. So that's how I jumped on with my production company to make this film. As soon as I had that, I had some blood in the water, I reached out to Vox, right? And I said, hey, we're already able to go up and go on this expedition and do this research. How would you guys like to have an explainer um, series that's created that would fit within your model? You could use some of the, the footage. Uh, and my um, my journalism partner on the project, um, Eli Kintish, also was involved with that, with that question and, and, and the creation of that. And he got a Pulitzer grant to be able to do that as well. So jumping down a little bit, Pulitzer jumped on. And then I knew we needed gear. And we were also in an area of the world where we're going to be testing these really sensitive sensors for, for, for light. And so there were two camera companies that were just starting to make these really sensitive sensors. I thought it'd be really great if they could field test them themselves, maybe give us some cameras to use that could come on as partners. So GoPro and Sony both came on and they were in-kind partners. They gave us um, uh, gear to work with and we gave them some footage on the back end. And finally, I reached out to NetGeo and they were a publication partner and also put in some money to be able to support this. Right, so that's how it all got going. And once you've got the balls turning, then all of a sudden you can add on all these other things. And I won't walk you through all the different um, elements here as they came on, but one begot the next. And eventually the kind of end place for this project, the end place for me spiritually, um, is we got to present the work to policymakers um, at the UN Climate Conference um, back in 2021 in Glasgow, um, and to a number of other research uh, and policy bodies um, throughout the EU, um, looking at what can be done um, in regards to light uh, pollution to protect the Arctic. Um, and that to me was really exciting. That's what we wanted to do from an impact perspective, and we did end up getting there. Okay, um, so much more that, that that could be said, but I am mindful of time. So I'm gonna stop our share there and jump over to see if you all have any questions. Well, uh, before we jump into questions, I just wanna invite everyone to give another virtual round of applause for a whirlwind tour of how to create meaningful and impactful storytelling. And I think, importantly, how to partner with storytellers that you don't need to be both a scientist and a professional photographer. There are amazing people who are both of those things like Mike, but there are lots of people who are at the ready to work with you to tell amazing stories. So I, I really took that away from the presentation. I know we have a question um, from Sarah in the chat. Uh, which I will read in a moment. But if you have a question for Mike, please write that in the chat or go ahead and raise your hand uh, on Zoom and we can call you on screen to ask Mike your question. Um, Sarah would be interested in knowing if science storytelling should be implemented in schools or academic education. Boy, that's such a great question. I wish I could put an uh, asterisk on that because you've, I think you've nailed where it's going. And I'll, I'll say that in the last three years, probably 80% of my work has um, been working with schools um, on all levels um, from elementary all the way up through um, postgraduate researchers um, and sharing this information and talking about this, informa this information and thinking about how we can become better storytellers as scientists and also how we can get 
more people in the room, right? One of the things we know is that to be able to drive impact around these issues, and we, if you're a climate scientist, you you know we've got a, a, we have some things we got to get done. We've got an amount of time we got to do it in. Well, we're going to need to get a lot more people in the room to be able to do that. We're going to need policymakers in the room. We need business and industry people in the room, right? We need scientists. We need journalists. We need artists. And we're not building those networks well enough. And we're not sharing some of this knowledge about what what actually drives change from a storytelling perspective well enough to do this. So what's really, really exciting is um, not only a lot of these, um, these sort of think tanks and hubs are being built, and I'm, I'm a part of a few at several universities um, around the US um, and around the UK, um, but we're starting to see more and more that um, scientific storytelling, visual storytelling is becoming, if not an elective, but a requirement um, at, at universities. I and mean, we're seeing it more and more at schools too. So there's it's an enormous demand. And I think it's a really exciting time for this. And again, you know, Part of the reason is that we've realized that reason alone does not a revolution make, right? It's it's just, it's an oversimplification of the way that change happens in society. You know, and any student of social change will be able to tell you that pretty quickly. Um, you know, for, for starters, every single successful uh, social movement of the 20th century had visual storytelling at its very core. And the, the organizers that were behind that work knew that that was important. Um, but, you know, also secondarily, it's just not how individuals work. Right. You know, if we think about what we do with our time and if we were to be analyzed for, you know, the things that we believe in and why we believe in them. Right. It's not as data driven as we would like them to think, probably even among the most, um, you know, academic and uh, mathematically, scientifically minded of, of us. And um, we're just not quite that kind of animal. A and especially when you look at a cross section of society. And I think we're getting better at understanding that. And so pedagogically, we're catching up to that. Uh, and making sure that scientists do have do have these tools. So it's a very exciting time. Uh, just before jumping on this call, two more universities wrote to ask for a similar class for that very reason. So it is happening, and I think it's a good thing. Amazing. Uh, thank you. We have another uh, question that has come in from Gabriella, and then we will hand it over to Brian, who I see has his hand up. Um, so Gabriella would like to know, as scientists, we usually start out with the science and only when we have an accepted manuscript, we start to think about outreach. When do you think would be a good time to think about storytelling, reaching beyond the pure science results? How much time is needed by professionals to help tell the story beyond the pure scientific publication? Well, that's a great nuts and bolts question. Um, and yeah, super important one. Um, by the time you've published, it, I wouldn't say it's too late um, because you can uh, publish in an academic uh, journal um, because you can always create media after the fact. But a lot of top end um, publications, think uh, Nat Geo certainly, but also Washington Post or New York Times, they tend to like to get their publications out to time exactly with the day um, or if not the week that your publication in the peer reviewed journal comes out. Right. So that means you got to walk it back to some earlier stage in your research where you really should be partnering with your storyteller and with this publication outlet. So ideally, it's considerably before the the the, the publication date. So what I would suggest doing are two things. One is just building working relationships with visual storytellers. And I maintain relationships I check up not infrequently with researchers that, that I admire. Um, I attend conferences and I, um, I connect with them as well. So I, I, I would suggest investing in those relationships. Um, I think they're important. And that way that's already on the ground. It's sort of built by the time you say, oh, hey, you know what? There's a really cool piece of research. I think it's gonna get a great publication. I can get you there. You know, there's there's some really amazing people. You kind of get the juices flowing. For, you know, your photographer is going to get excited about those things. Um, and then you can start to bring the publication, you know, that you eventually want to publish in at that time, too. And just to, like, open open the window on this a little bit, um, I have a I can't say too much about this because it's not to, it's not to be published yet. Um, but I was working on a project, a science and climate related story in Australia last summer. Um, and before I even traveled, and this was like the second year of research for the researchers that were doing the work. But before I even traveled, I had reached out to the outlet uh, and at least put it on their radar. They didn't fund it at that time. Uh, you know, they weren't um, giving it a green light on publication, but they were aware of it. So I don't think there's such a thing as too early. I guess I'll say that. Um, there probably is such a thing as too late, but you, the, there are opportunities at, at, at any stage of the game. Great, thank you for that nuts and bolts answer. Uh, I am going to now bring Brian on to ask his question. 
Hey, thanks a lot for being here, Mike. I've got a question for you around approaching scientists to tell stories. Uh, as a storyteller, not a visual storyteller, but as a storyteller, we typically see that the sciences stay away from storytelling to uh, protect their integrity as a scientist. How do you see uh, what is the best way to approach scientists in order to convince them the power of telling their own story about their own research? Yeah, that's a I, that's a great question. And I can tell right away that you're a, a storyteller by the quality of that microphone that you've got in front of you and that, that wonderful radio voice you've got as well. Um, yeah, th so that's definitely um, a, a barrier that exists. I, I have to say, in my experience, it tends to... It might be a generational barrier. I think it's changing. Uh, certainly, and I, I don't mean to say that if you're an older scientist, you necessarily fall into that. But I just mean to say, generally, I think there's some shifts that are that are happening. Um, because a lot of the scientists that are doing amazing work these days that I know about are also rock stars at managing the media side. And I think it's being seen more and more um, that it's, uh, it's certainly an opportunity, if not a necessity, really to succeed um, academically. Um, and uh, I've I've been working with a number of universities in the past couple of years, thinking about potentially even transitioning to um, an academic position. And whenever I've talked to them about the work that I do, a lot of times the schools have said, "Look, your ability to be able to reach out and drive impact, at either whether we're hiring you as a scientist or whether we're hiring you as a storyteller, is part of the reason why we're hiring you. That's part of the metric of what how way we value researchers is impact beyond the number of publications you have." It's also presence in the field. It's also leadership. So I think researchers are understanding that. Um, and I'll also say that, and this is only anecdotally, I, I guess you can share this with, <laughs> with researchers that, that, that maybe you talked to, but over the past 10 years of doing this work, when we've had a highly successful project, and Into the Dark would be a great example of that, um, all, all of the scientists that I have worked with have come back and said, you know, in, so, in some ways, that has been more of a boon for my work than X number of other things have have been right. It's um it drives an incredible amount of resources and attention managed properly, hopefully in a positive way back towards them. So, you know, I again I think it is an old um it it is an issue and it needs to be handled handled sensitively. I think there's plenty of ways that you could um you could tarnish somebody's reputation. Um and and, and that's part of the reason why too when you look for your storytellers, you you do have to kind of vet them and look for the right one. Uh, which is why I was pointing you towards those um, those organizations which vet the storytellers that that come in. Um, but that's also why the relationship makes such a big difference, right? I would suggest um, you spend some time getting to know folks um, before you reach out with them. And I'll I'll say as a final final thought here, just a piece of piece of insight to 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 making media. Um, you know, anytime I've had a project go upside down, it was it was an interpersonal issue. I think rather than a skill issue. You know, um, it's becoming easier and easier to be a great visual storyteller, to be honest. You can learn these skills online. Cameras are getting easier and easier to use. But having a, a you know, really wonderful person and a partner to work with, that, that's harder to find. You know, um, I don't mean it's harder than it was in the past. I just mean it's harder to find than raw technical skills. So I, I would really suggest, again, in investing in that connection and building that relationship, because that's going to be the capital that allows you to make these projects um, the right way and do them in a way that really builds your reputation. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, sir. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Brian, for that great question. Uh, I learned a lot from that and thinking about my relationship with storytellers like Mike, um, but also how to be a good partner and be open to, uh, you know, new partnerships. So we are almost at time, but have time for one final question. So we have our last question from Dot, who asks, who, how do we start to seek financial support as individual scientists for storytelling, if not part of a research project, but as a community-based project? Great, great question. I, I really feel like you guys are hitting hitting all the core nuts and bolts things here, right? Show me the money. Where's the money? Um, okay, so in, in my experience, you've, you've, got, you've got really two groups of options there. One is I'm starting to see more and more, and folks can tell me if this is true or not from their own perspective, but um, more and more grants for research are starting to have line items for, for storytelling or for community engagement or outreach or whatever it's called in the, in the grant. 
I, I think it is probably a thing that's being done a little bit better and funded a little bit better in the EU um, and in Britain than in the US. I'm not sure about that. That's more kind of um, anecdotal than anything else, but um, but there, but that's an emerging space. And again, part of it out of this understanding that it's part of what it what makes science count, right? Is social understanding, uh, building awareness, uh, building uh, behavior policy changes is part of what what counts. Um, so, th so that's there, and that's probably the thing that you have the most direct access to. The the other option, the other the other family options are are grants for storytelling, and hopefully your stellar your storytelling partner will have access to those, have ideas for those, and many many of the projects that. That, that I work on, um, we pull down from both of those branches simultaneously. So the, the, the research side will bring certain things to bear. It may be flying me to the place that we need to get to. It may be before we bring a partner on, um, a publication partner getting me out of the field. You know, There may be some things that they can bring down through their grants. Um, maybe it's to produce one particular kind of media. And then I'll bring down money over here to produce other things as well. And there's ways uh, legally and structurally we can break those things apart so that they're not in conflict with each other in, term, in terms of ownership. So whenever I jump onto a project, that's, the, that's my wheelhouse. Um, and I have those resources over there. I, I'd love to think that visual storytellers are getting more savvy about that because uh, the traditional ways of funding journalism and visual storytelling, those are drying up and changing really, really quickly. As, as you may have heard or noticed, the landscape of traditional journalism has changed a lot in the last 10 years. And folks like myself are having to become very, very good at finding a way to survive the different revenue streams. I spend a lot of my time doing that and a fair amount of my time teaching about that too. Um, so hopefully there, there I, I won't go into what, what that might look like because that's on, on that side. You can reach out to me for more information on that. Or again, hopefully through those networks that I suggested to you, if you find a storyteller, th they would suggest that. Um, and really, I think that is also a measure of their value. Um, because if they're saying, no, you need to pay for this all yourself, you, uh, um, you know, it's it's fine for them to have some expectations that you could bring some um, some 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 benefits to bear, but but really they should be able to um, pay part of their way too and, and be able to bring things in. So um, that's where I was just looking for that second half of that support is through them. Great, thank you, Mike, for answering those nuts and bolts questions and also those big picture questions. Um, and again, I would just like to invite everyone to give a virtual round of applause. Thank you so, so much, Mike, for sharing your insights and your experience and your professional expertise on how to tell better and more impactful stories that can truly change the world. Uh, I know this group of scientists, storytellers, uh, community members really appreciated uh, this presentation. So thank you. Great, it's glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And don't hesitate to reach out if somebody has um, a question or wants to connect. And I will make sure to share both Mike and Brian's contact information with everyone who registered for this webinar. I will be sending out a full recording of the webinar later today and an invitation to register for free for upcoming webinars. We have a webinar next month on Arctic borders and transnational actors and on immigration and security in the Finnish Arctic. And then in March, we have a webinar on community-led research and conflict with traditional academic approaches. I hope to see all of you at those two webinars and hope that you will join our Migration in Harmony Research Coordination Network. Again, I'm Victoria Herman. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day if you're in Alaska or evening if you are in Europe. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.